So, hello everyone. Uh, this is a very odd presentation for me to give, and I'm going to give it my best try. Uh, I am standing here right now in our um, Berlin studio, um, facing an empty room. Because the idea was uh, back in January that I would travel to your university and give this talk in person. Um, but obviously with the current goings on, uh, that's not possible. So I hope this will be a good substitute uh, and I hope um, my talk will at least entertain you. Yeah, so my name is Quinton and I'm the uh, lead UI programmer here at Ubisoft Berlin. Um, and what I want to talk to you today, what I want to talk about today is like what's in the help bar. Um, I want to give you an overview of what my specialty actually is, of what I do um, for game development, and also give you some practical advice on stuff that tends to go wrong when making UI for your own games. So let's start with what does a UI programmer actually do? Um, I would say that the main thing is that we implement the interface between the player and the game. And that has different dimensions to it. It has different aspects. Um, but what it comes down to is that on one side, we explain the state of the game, what is going on uh, in the game world, and that the players can then react to that. So you can see here, we have a number of health bars, uh, a number of other bars that inform the player about what is, what is the game doing right now. And the other end of it is that we connect the players to the game. Specifically, like how do they input uh, their commands to the game so that they can understand it? Um, and both of these, both of these uh, dimensions are important for doing UI um, because, like, if the game cannot talk to you, you cannot um, understand what is going on. If you cannot talk to the game, then you cannot play it. Um, there are two main categories of UI that I can really. Uh, <laughs> described from my line of work. We have menus um, and we have HUD. So a menu looks kind of like this. It is like usually uh, like a big screen that takes up the entire space and HUD is overlaid on top of the gameplay. So um, the difference being that with a menu, there's no game input. You cannot control the game while inside the menu. While with uh, HUD, it is overlaid on top of the gameplay. So you can, you're actually playing the game while menu items are being displayed. Um, so the game on the right is of course Battlefront 2 and the game on the left is Rise of the Tomb Raider. And I did actually make this menu. I worked on that game. Um, so yeah, but when we talk about like the difference between menu and HUD, it gets really blurry um, because we can have in-game notifications and you can treat them as a menu or a HUD. If they're on top of the game, then yeah, they're, they're HUD elements. But if the game is paused while the notification is shown, then it's a menu. So let's just call everything a screen because it just makes everything easier. It's menus are menus and that's fine. Let me just get my phone because I realized, yep. <laughs> yeah, I need to move into the frame a bit more. Okay. So next. Um, for UI programming, what are the main areas of focus? We have uh, input handling, which is about the controllers, the keyboard, the mouse, all kinds of input devices, but also about being able to rebind the controls so that players can have the best possible experience. Because not, not everyone likes to play the way we initially designed the keyboard layout, for example. Um, it's also about focus handling. When your cursor is on top of an element, you give focus to that element and the player can input uh, what they want. But how do you deal with the player then deciding to go to another element? Uh, focus handling sounds like one of those things that should be obvious, but can be very hard to get right on any particular project. Um, it's also about the data flow. You need to be able to read from the game and write back to the game. Like if you're entering your email address, you first need to ask like, what is my current email address that is stored on a database somewhere? Um, then when you write it, that becomes part of the input handling, of course, but you write it back to something and then upload it again to the server. That flow often tends to be UI work. And finally, you have the most obvious thing, which is 2D rendering, uh, being able to draw images and text um, and also the types of widgets 
um, like buttons and sliders and steppers, all sorts of things that you need to make good menus. Now, luckily, most of these topics are handled by some of the framework that we use. But still, for every game, there's going to be some custom work that needs to be done um, in order to integrate the framework with the engine that you're using. So some common frameworks that you will see out in the wild are Skillform. Uh, this is what I started using uh, when I started making games professionally. Um, it's based on Flash, um, but it's not very popular anymore. And the main reason for that is that Flash is very old and is no longer supported by Adobe. Um, and some people like to say that Flash is very slow. I disagree. Uh, Flash is only slow if you look at performance of the game, but not performance of the artist and the programmers using it. Um, the, the new hot thing in town is Coherent UI, which is based on HTML5. And I strongly recommend, like, if you're interested in UI development, learn HTML5. It is the future. Um, but we also have, of course, your standard Unity UI framework. You can draw boxes, you can draw text, it's fine. So the next big thing that I would like to talk about is the pitfalls of UI development. Like what can go wrong when you're making your game? Um, and like, how can we resolve those types of issues? Like what is the best way to go about it? So I'm gonna pitch basically a small game to you and we're gonna pretend it's a Unity project. I'm not gonna show you any code because I think that we'll be go, going too far in depth, but I want you to imagine the code behind it. And I will try to explain a bit like what's going on. Um, so what's gonna happen is that we start out very fine. We get kind of stuck. And then I'm gonna help you unstuck, get unstuck. So let's begin. We're making a side-scrolling shooter looks amazing as you can see I, I definitely did not use like an asset pack for these sprites um, so our heroine goes from left to right and she just goes and shoots monsters um, our game is getting very close to beta so we've already passed our alpha milestone and now we're showing off the game to actual players and you know the players have some feedback so at the moment uh, this is what happens when you shoot um, the enemy acknowledges that it's being shot, but it doesn't indicate how many times it can be shot. So it is missing a health bar. So that's what we are going to add. The design has acknowledged that players need to know exactly how much health an enemy has left. So we're gonna add health bars. Um, they're gonna be on top of the enemies. And they're gonna be green when they're full. Uh, at 50%, they're gonna be yellow. And when it's 10%, they become red and they start blinking. Uh, so the way our game is made, again, similar to Unity, um, these are all entities. So our first entity is the player and it has a component on top of it, uh, a world component, which gives it a position inside our level. But that's all it does. It doesn't do any behavior. It just says like, this entity can be placed in the level. It has a player input component, which allows the player to actually uh, modify the position of that entity inside the world. It has a sprite render component because we need to be able to see uh, both position and see the entity. Um, and it has a bullet spawn component because as we saw, like when you press a particular button, it spawns the bullets and kills enemies. Uh, on the enemy side, we have a world component as well. We have a sprite render component we have an enemy behavior component because it's probably gonna move left and right. Um, and we have a health component. So the question was like, how do we add a health bar to our enemy? And it looks like that health component is what we wanna focus on. So looking at that, what does it actually do right now in the game? Um, it tracks the entity's health. So um, entities have a current health and they have a maximum health. Um, and if the health goes below zero, uh, so below or equal zero, it destroys the entity. So very simple behavior, but that is enough for now. It also has the uh, ability to react to events because when you shoot it with the bullet, it decreases the health. So what we can do is modify this component and add our health bar on top. So we add a reference to a UI screen in our component. And we say with a bit of logic, um, we have our health values uh, that are between some numbers. 
stick ahead. Yeah, so between zero and 320. Um, but we can normalize it so that it is actually between zero and one. And there's a formula for that that's pretty basic. Um, but this allows us to render the bar um, at a particular width. Because if you then have a normalized value, you can multiply it by how wide the bar should be as in this maximum width, and you get the actual value right now. So this is a very simple way to directly influence a health bar and have it render according to the amount of health the enemy has left. Um, we also add the color logic on top of this uh, so that this uh, health component will say like, if the health goes below 0 0.5, it should be yellow. If it goes below uh, 0 0.1, uh, then it becomes red and starts flashing. So yeah, that seems to work. So we have our um, player, we have our uh, enemy, and when we shoot it, um, it decreases the health. Awesome, ship it, right? However, design comes in and they still are requesting some changes. Um, they would like uh, to, it to be a bit more polished. They like what we've done so far, but they feel it's not clear yet to the player what's going on. So the first thing is they want some polish on the animation. Um, the health bar needs to flash red when drained. They feel that this would be a better way to indicate to the player that this enemy is about to die. So uh, you get this type of animation and then it will blow up. Um, so what that means in our code is that when the health actually reaches zero, we need to start this flashing animation. We need to wait for it to complete and then destroy the entity. So that's a bit of a tricky logic thing. Uh, but of course, we can just do that inside our components because we are directly rendering the bar. So when we see that the health is below zero, we can use the logic inside uh, to make sure that we play the animation before we destroy, destroying the entity. So then, yeah, we have barrels. Um, barrels also have, um, well, they are also destroyable. So they have their own health component. But what that means is that we added this health bar inside the health component. So barrels will have a health bar too. This is not what design wants. So is there something that we can be done about this? Um, luckily there is an easy fix. Um, again, with the framing of Unity in mind, what you would do is add a flag inside of your component, expose it to the editor, and then say like, well, we have a is health bar a visible flag. And for our entities uh, that shouldn't have a health bar, like the barrels, we just turn it off, simple. Um, and the final thing is that, yeah, we really only want to display the health bar when the player is near an enemy. Um, we saw that when you have a lot of enemies on the screen and they all have health bars, it gets too confusing. So you need to check the distance between your player entity and your enemy entities and display the health bar only in that case. So we check the distance um, and if the distance is close enough, we set the visibility flag the one we just added, so we can just reuse that. Um, and then you get this kind of effect. Super cool. Finally, when enemies die, the current like flashing is not good enough, so we really just want to really emphasize that the enemy is dead. Um, so we want to add an explosion effect. We start the animation when the health reaches zero, and then it disappears. So, that the way to implement that is the same as the health bar animation. Um, we would have an additional sprite animation. Um, and we would say if the health reaches below zero, we start both the health bar animation and the, the sprite animation for destroying the enemy. Um, and that seems to work fine. Yeah, QA would like a word. Um, we seem to have introduced a number of issues in the game. The first is that we have made some objects indestructible. Um, because objects without a death animation cannot be destroyed. And the reason for that is our logic is so tied to the design that we assume that every entity with a health component will also have a death animation. And we check if the death animation is complete before destroying the entity. But if there is no animation to be played, yeah, it gets stuck. The next is um, secret health bars. So, Barrels shouldn't have a health bar, right? But when you get close to them, 
it appears. A bit odd. Um, finally, another programmer on our team added an ability for certain enemies that they can heal themselves. Um, but when they play this ability, the, the bar doesn't change. Um, that's not so good because the bar should always indicate the current uh, amount of health an enemy has. So that's not great. Um, we have introduced these uh, issues, that's clear. Um, but we can also, well, I can now help you figure out what went wrong here. Um, I want to show you like the common issue with doing a UI in this way and why it makes sense to take a step back and look at it in a different way. So let's look at each bug individually. We have our indestructible objects. The problem is, yeah, we assume that every health component has a death animation. But a simple fix in here is to kill the entity immediately if it doesn't have an animation. So I say that it's like an easy fix, but it's actually, it's kind of like uh, we introduce technical debt because um, we make the code more complicated. You need to check if you have an animation before you play it. And if you don't have an animation, you need to use a different code path. And that sounds fine right now, but when you're dealing with like hundreds of entities with hundreds of components, that starts to add up in terms of things that you have to track. So it's not an ideal solution, but it is something that we can easily fix. The next was the secret health bars. And to me, the problem was obvious. Like, yeah, wells get health bars due to the proximity check. Um, the problem was that we had this one visibility flag, but we're using it for two different purposes. So the user could specify in the editor that they didn't want this entity to have a health bar by unchecking the box. But inside the logic of the health component, while we were doing the proximity check, we were using the same flag. So even if the user had unchecked that box, uh, if you get close to an entity uh, with a health component, it would just check the box again. Um, the solution here is that you need to have two visibility flags. One is for the user that they can specify in the editor, and the other is for the proximity. Then when you say, do I need to render the health bar? Uh, does it need to be visible? You check both flags. And if they both resolve to true, that's when you render. But a question to be asked here is like, why have a flag in the first place? Uh, because not all of these health components are the same. Um, what we've seen is that we use a health component to say that an enemy has health, but we also use it to say that a destructible object has health. What if we create a separate component for entities that want a health bar? Um, we can have a new component that can just fetch the data from the health component itself. And in that way, uh, we can say, when you make an enemy, you add both the health component and this new component. And when you make a barrel, you only add the health component because it doesn't need this other behavior. And that's another trap that we as programmers fall into. We see a problem, we see an easy fix, but we don't take the step back and look at why did this problem uh, start in the first place. And like, I'm, I'm not shaming anyone, by the way, because I do the same thing. I also go for the easy fix because I have a lot of things on my plate. Um, so the last bug was we had this healing ability and it wasn't working properly. The problem was that we only update the health bar on the events. When the enemy is hit by a bullet, that's when we say we need to update the health bar. Um, but when you have this ability, it doesn't use an event. It writes to the health value directly. Um, and we couldn't have foreseen this because another programmer was actually working on this ability. Um, and they implemented it in a way that looked fine to them. And it did work fine, except it didn't render properly. The fix here, we can update the health bar every frame. Uh, we can just say, we do the calculation for normalizing the values. We can do the calculation for uh, rendering the width of the bar. And if we do that every frame, um, then it always will be correct. But yeah, updating every frame is also not ideal because it's, it's kind of wasteful. Um, if nothing changes, then why do the update? Uh, we should be able to check if anything has changed, right? Um, so there is actually a way to do that. It's basically just comparing two values. It's saying this was the old value, this is the new value. Uh, if, the, if they are not the same, then swap them um, so that next frame you don't have to update again. But 
I want to talk to you about a better way to deal with this in general. Um, a better way to add UI to your game um, without creating all of these inadvertent bugs. Um, because the way I evaluate that uh, is that the original sin was uh, trying tying the game state directly to your UI. So as soon as something in the game state changes, we immediately try to fix it in the UI. And there are other ways to approach this. And the, what I want to talk to you about is something called model view, view model, MVVM. Um, where the model is the state of your game. This is basically the data um, of what is happening in the game. Meaning in our case, these are the health values for all of our entities. The view, uh, it's the wrong one, but sure, uh, is, the, is how you present it to the user. Um, in our example, that will be the Unity UI framework. And the view model binds both together. And that's really the magic. Uh, instead of having the model directly push into the view or the view directly getting from the model, you go via this view model intermediary, which tracks like what are the actual changes um, and how do I communicate between those two layers. Um, this is really what I would consider the gold standard in UI. It was invented by Microsoft in about 2005, and it was first used in their Windows presentation framework. Um, so what you do in WPF, you create a, a XAML file, uh, which has bindings to your data. Then in C Sharp, you create a view model, um, and you say, uh, when the XAML file is executed, it looks for these bindings and the, the c -sharp script can then feed it data. Um, and yeah, this was so popular that it was copied everywhere. And basically every mature uh, UI framework uh, now has some variation of this model. So what does MVVM really mean in this case? The view is unaware of the model. So views can be initialized at any time. Um, it also means that you can have between zero and infinite amount of views because the view doesn't care about the data as, as such. It needs a connection to the view model, which is uh, commonly done via data binding. Um, but if you don't even have the data, you can still initialize the view. It's independent from each other. And yeah, you can have many views per model. So in the case of our um, health values, the health bar is one view. So you want to render uh, just a value on top of the enemy. But if you're making a scoreboard, um, you could take the same models from all of your um, uh, enemy entities, look at all of their values and present it as a graph instead of a bar. Um, so this becomes a very powerful way of saying both to your programmers, hey, um, don't worry about the UI right now, just worry about what data is actually involved here. And also for your UI artists to say, hey, just make the UI and we'll figure out the data binding together and then off you go. You don't have a dependency on the programmers anymore. You can just move to another screen that you need to make. Okay, so applying MVVM to this game that I described. Uh, let's fix the game. First thing is you create a model. <clears throat> so the health component is actually all, is our model already. Um, it has all the data that we need, uh, the current health, the maximum health, and you could argue it's tracks whether the entity is still alive. So done, nothing to do here. The view is also straightforward uh, because if you go with the Unity model, then you have a UI screen as, uh, as something in your editor. Um, we create a reference to this somehow and done. But the magic is in creating the view model because that's the part that we were missing. So we create a new type of component, the health bar view model component, which I know is a mouthful, but uh, it's still important to get the name right. Um, this is actually the owner of the UI screen. So instead of adding it directly to the health component, as we did before, we now have this intermediary that adds it. Um, this component will read the values directly from the health component and then translate them for the Unity system. Uh, yeah, so it will write the values directly to that screen. Uh, so when I talked about doing the color logic, um, about like normalizing the values, that is no longer being handled by the health component. It is all done inside the view model component. 
So if you want to add logic, then the view model will have the logic for animations. Um, and it will send events to the health component uh, to wait before destroying. Um, yeah, it will update the values every frame. Um, and that is just because it's safer to do so. Um, we use this pattern, a dirty value, to check if the value has actually changed. Um, and every frame, we just push those values and should be fine. The logic is still very complicated. Um, unfortunately, there's no way to get around this. When I say that like, yeah, we send an event to the health component to say like, don't destroy yourself just yet. What that means in practice is that uh, when the health goes below zero, the health component broadcasts an event saying, anyone that cares, uh, I am going to destroy myself. The health or view model component will capture that event and send one back immediately saying, wait, hold on, don't destroy just yet. I need to wait for my animation to finish. The health bar component then says, okay, uh, well, give me a signal when you're ready. Um, and it waits for that signal and destroys itself. And there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong here. Because if the health bar component says like, yeah, uh, does anyone need anything? And it doesn't get a reply, what do you do? It could mean that, the, uh, that there is no health bar view model component to care about this, or it could just be timing out. Um, there's no real good way to get around this. And that's why UI programmers in general don't like doing these type of animations. They're always complicated. Um, and keep in mind, when I talk about MVVM, there are downsides. What I like to say is if, uh, if I describe an idea to you, and I don't mention any downsides, I'm not actually describing an idea, I'm selling you a product. Um, the downsides of MVM are, there's more code to maintain. We needed to add another component, uh, a view model. We needed to really track like, uh, what is part of our data? What is part of our view? How do I communicate between that? There's more chances for things to go wrong. It makes the logic more complicated because events are going back and forth. The events can get lost. Uh, events can get processed incorrectly. Uh, when they do, it becomes harder to figure out what goes wrong. Um, and it all becomes like more complicated to maintain. Also the invalidation of data. Um, yeah, when something changes like the health value, uh, when do you actually invalidate the health bar? You can do it every frame as I described but that's not necessarily performant when you have thousands of entities. So once you start like caching the data, once you start figuring out when do I need to update this or that, um, yeah, things get messy. And finally, it will have an impact on performance, however slight. You're adding additional components, you're uh, doing more interaction. Um, yeah, it might not be the best choice for your particular game especially when you're making a, a gigantic game, um, you might actually choose to go back to uh, writing values directly uh, because it's faster. And that was the end of my talk. Um, I hope you had a good time with it. Um, I think I have, yeah, I didn't take as much time as I thought I would. Um, what I just want to end with is like a personal anecdote um, because Back in 2009, I was uh, studying game programming um, at IGAT in the Netherlands. And we got a guest lecture from some people from Crytek. Um, and they talked about their level design tools, about how they uh, designed Crisis 1. Um, and the entire lecture hall was packed with people. Everyone wanted to see them. They were so, so cool, so nice. And to think like 10 years or so later, I am the one giving you a talk and it's super cool to me. So what I want to give you is like, uh, I hope that in your career, you also have the opportunity to do something like this. And that's it. Thank you for listening. <laughs> now we go to the questions. Okay, first question coming here. Yeah. So um, Alexander Orlovsky says, uh, in my opinion, writing tests for game object states is pretty crucial for success during game development. Having tech debt means only bad design. As some of my clients' teams have sprints where they just refactor the code two weeks straight because creating mess would decrease the productivity. It's a fact. 
yeah, there's nothing to disagree with here. Um, so yeah, writing uh, tests for your game object states can be um, crucial. Yes, I agree. Um, the downside is that it can slow you down as well. The reality of game development is that it can move very quickly. Because unlike regular software development, it's not just about making a good product and having users uh, enjoy it and maybe spending money. It's also about this nebulous thing called fun. So you might end up making a whole system that works perfectly, but isn't fun, and you have to redo it in some other way. Um, yeah. But tech debt is definitely something to keep in mind. Um, and I would say with MVVM, you can slightly decrease that. Uh, another question from Michael. Uh, sometimes it's sad to see how a rather simple and working concept can get really uh, more and more complicated or screwed up due to small change requests from other stakeholders. Would you state that agile development with all that iterations contributes to the problem or does it more support a fast fixes? Um, I am a big proponent of agile development and the reason for that is mainly I do not believe that we know what a good game actually is until we have it in our hands. So if you do not build in this iteration process right from the beginning, um, Windows will shut down. No, I don't want that. Um, so if you do not bake that iteration process into your development, um, you can end up with a very, very rigid process where, yeah, you have everything laid out, uh, but it ultimately, it's not fun. Um, so yeah, I would say that Agile is, is very important uh, for making a successful game. Right, from uh, Linus, um, as the lead UI programmer, how does a day at work look? Uh, okay, so I get in, so let's, let's assume that it's a normal day and I actually go into the office, right? Uh, so I'm in the office at around eight. Um, what I do is I make a cup of tea and then I check my emails. Um, I then um, look at my uh, notebook. I use a, a bullet journal and I look at some of the tasks that I've written for myself. Um, I mark the task every day as either long-term, mid-term, or short-term. Um, I do the long-term things first, uh, because otherwise I just don't do them. Um, so that could mean, if for my current projects, I am looking at how to deal with a feature that is currently thought about being designed for the next milestone, so in like four weeks or so, so that I can figure out who to talk to um, to get this feature actually in when it's time to start building it. Um, so that is usually like my morning. I take about an hour to, to process both my emails and my tasks. Um, then at around, uh, I, I start writing some code, but I usually get distracted. So it's like, it's fine. Um, at about around 10, we have our uh, daily standups. So with the team on our projects, we talk about, um, what did we do yesterday? What are we going to do today? Is there anything blocking us? Um, after that, until like from uh, quarter past 10 to about 12, um, I work on code stuff or I talk to people um, to help unblock them. Um, yeah, I say I do code stuff, but it's, it's mostly gonna be meetings about this or that. Um, I have lunch at 12 uh, every day. Uh, and at around one, I start basically having meetings again um, about either design or um, talking to the people that report to me. Um, and it's gonna be a mix of both writing code, reading documentation, writing emails, until five when I uh, leave for home. And I would say that's a pretty typical day filled with meetings and code. Then from Paul, C-sharp related. What do you think about using I notify property chains handler to implement MVVM instead of dirty flags? I think that's a good idea. Um, if your framework supports uh, that type of notification, then you should definitely take uh, advantage of that. Uh, the dirty value is really a way to, to quickly get the result that you need uh, without adding too much code. Um, but most game engines that I've worked with already have like uh, either a notify ability or some type of event handler. Um, so yeah, I think that's a good idea. Then, oh, or sorry, uh, or would it not be MVVM anymore because I'm only using events. Uh, I'm not someone to split hairs. Um, 
using events or dirty flags, it's fine. Uh, dirty flags themselves are not an aspect of MVVM. The, important is, the importance is really that you have this view model in between your view and your model. And what that looks like or how you use it, that's really up to you and your specific needs. From Alexander, does Ubisoft have software architects and how many code reviews you do each year? It's good that you mentioned that because I forgot about it. Um, during my daily work, I do many code reviews. Uh, what we say in our team is before we submit any code to our uh, source control uh, system, they, it has to be reviewed by multiple people. And as a lead, the way that works, um, when I write some code and I put it up for review, I always add uh, either a person that knows about that code or a junior. Um, so sometimes it's both. Um, the idea is that you want someone to check what you've written uh, because it's easy to overlook this or that. But also uh, with the juniors that we have, it's important that they learn what good code looks like. And even more importantly, that they see that it's okay to say to a lead like me, uh, hey, your code is kind of shit. Um, like they need to be able to, to call me out on things that I do wrong uh, because otherwise uh, I don't get the feedback that I need uh, to write proper code as well. Um, but your specific question was, do we have software architects, right? Yeah. So how many code reviews do I do each year? <laughs> Uh, hundreds, hundreds and hundreds each year. Um, we have a number of architects um, in our studio, um, but we call them directors. Uh, so we have uh, Karsten, uh, who is, uh, I think, is not, uh, I don't know the exact title, but he is like the architect for multiple projects. Um, and he's at that level where he's giving technical guidance on multiple projects without actually being part of the day-to-day -day development. Um, and that's just our studio. Uh, every studio has a setup like that. And then on top of that, you have people that manage multiple studios. And then you get to like the, uh, the chief level uh, where they manage every studio for Ubisoft. And yeah, I don't know how those people manage, but apparently they do. Then, Question from Joseph, uh, where can we buy the game? Yes, uh, yeah, it's currently in development as you saw, it still has some bugs, um, but you know, keep a lookout for, for Steam Early Access, uh, maybe next year. And from Linus, is my work bound to one particular project at a time or do I work on multiple projects? So luckily, my work is constrained to one project, uh, which is a, a big game. Um, and that's because I'm a, a lead developer. Uh, the next level uh, is a director and directors manage multiple projects. Um, yeah, so for me, that means that I, I manage a smaller team within a bigger game um, and make the, the technical decisions about that. Cool. And, okay. From Amelia, uh, what would you tell to someone who wants to become a game UI programmer or artist and are asking you advice on what to look at or read? So if uh, you want to be uh, a UI programmer, I would advise you to look at HTML5. Um, look at uh, JavaScript, look at stuff like the React framework, um, but there are many JavaScript frameworks that you can use uh, both to make games and to make UI. And the reason for that is that I strongly feel that this is the direction uh, my field is going into, that there's going to be less of a distinction between uh, making UI for websites and making UI for games or other applications. Um, that the knowledge is transferable um, so that you can um, like take people from a web development uh, background and integrate them into your game uh, team. Um, JavaScript itself is very powerful, even if a bit awkward to use sometimes. Um, and there are actually uh, free frameworks that you can use to integrate JavaScript and HTML5 in general um, in your C++ application. Um, so yeah, look into how to make UI with HTML5. And as a UI artist, which is uh, you know, a whole different ballgame. Um, 
most people that do UI art start out by saying, I want to do uh, character art or concept art. UI art is like a, it's a separate but not really discipline related to those, um, to those topics. Um, but if you want to start becoming a UI artist, I think the important thing is um, to figure out what you like seeing in particular UIs. Um, to use websites like Pinterest to create mood boards for the type of style you want to evoke. Um, and then trying to draw these 2D images um, that use that style. Um, and then, yeah, building up a portfolio uh, to show off like the type of UI that you can make. Um, and if you have programming friends, like <laughs> encourage them to look at your UI and say like, can you actually build this in a game or is it too fancy for um, what you would want to use? Uh, but really, I'm not the right person to ask about that. Uh, as you saw with my beautiful art, um, I try, but I'm not an artist. So, from, ah, yeah. Uh, Well, I guess Windows actually restarted. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we will wait. We should take some time. Maybe he will come back. <laughs> yes, uh, I told I told him the computer is done. Okay, cool. It's rebooting oh. right now. Okay, um, <laughs> but uh, the next question uh, was actually from Linus and. Uh, uh, Linus, you're really lucky because actually I'm uh, finishing my second year in size graduate program right now in oh. Ubisoft Berlin. Mm -hmm. And so I can quickly talk about it until uh, Quentin rejoin. So Sounds for good. people who don't know, uh, the Ubisoft graduate program is a two year fixed term contract you have with Ubisoft with um, the idea that after your first year as a um, an employee you will actually move to another studio. So we're really using um, the power of being a big groups like Ubisoft to allow international mobility and being able to work with multiple people. And you also have a lot more training and a lot more, uh, you know, opportunities to get to meet new people. I would extremely advise it to try to get into it if you want to go for a company like Ubisoft. At the end, um, it's a normal contract. So it's not something like uh, we're getting graduate and we pay them like intern, uh, so we do uh, smaller stuff. It's like you are a programmer in my case, and uh, as part of the special contract, we will train you in becoming efficient in um, international, multicultural, and um, yeah, uh, overly changing company like Ubisoft. So yeah, uh, apply, it's good. <laughs> awesome, thanks. And yeah, feel free to ask more questions. Uh, Windows, I, Windows is actually doing some update right now, that's perfect. <laughs> so I just posted a link to the uh, homepage of the graduate program, so if anybody wants to look, look at this. Ah, great, thank you. Mm. Well, well, well. <laughs> I'm glad we got you as a support, Amelia. <laughs> yeah, it's coming, it's coming. <laughs> so yeah, if you have more questions mm -hmm. about the graduate program in the meantime, feel free to ask. <laughs> or UI, you know, because I'm also here since I'm working closely with Quintin because I'm uh, one of the UI programmer at Ubisoft Berlin. Mm -hmm. Mm, would, would you have any advice on uh, for, for people who want to apply for the graduate program, like say you should have a strong portfolio or something like that? So portfolio is always good for any kind of application because uh, you're showing that you actually have been able to ship something. And this is one skill that uh, sometimes we forgot to teach. It's like finishing stuff. Maybe you will have a lot of side projects and maybe they will, you know, be excellent. But if you don't ship them to show them to someone, at the end, uh, you can use them to, to go further in the industry. So, yeah, strong portfolio with stuff you ship. 
stuff you're proud of and uh, that you can actually talk about is really interesting. And one thing that is important, uh, especially for that program, I think is critical thinking. So during the interview, people will probably ask you a question like, what was the most difficult thing you had to handle and what solution did you bring? And uh, or did you work out uh, with other people to make the solution happen? So one of my other advice is to not only think like about your technici technicity uh, and your specialty, but also think about how oh, you as a programmer, as a designer, etc., will act uh, in a team, a multicultural team, a different team of people that don't work like you and uh, how will you handle complicated situation? Because that's a skill you can use everywhere. And afterward, I just say, yeah, just look at Ubisoft before applying. It's always a good, uh, good advice. Um, you probably know the game, but get to know what our different studio, uh, look a bit at what people said about it online. It's always a thing if you go to an interview and ask question about the company that really reflects the company value, people will love it, you know. <laughs> so. Awesome. Um, I will maybe also point out in the meantime that uh, we actually planned an excursion or a trip to Ubisoft Düsseldorf for everybody who doesn't know already. Um, oh, goodness, already ready. I will, fi I will finish shortly. And um, yeah, so this trip was canceled due to uh, Corona restrictions and stuff. But if anyone is still interested in doing such a trip or something like that, feel free to hit me up and I will put you on a list. So if something is planned uh, in the near future, I can communicate it to you. Thanks. Okay. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> But uh, it did give me the opportunity to grab a chair um, and uh, the headset. Um, so yeah, Amelia already answered the question about the graduate program. Uh, were there any other? Yes, from Paul. Um, how much of my time is spent on talking to designers? Uh, do I schedule regular meetings uh, or only when particular problems arise? Um, so I like to talk to the designers daily, basically, um, or at least a couple of times a week to figure out um, what are their needs um, and how do I best uh, get there. It's often about uh, not just understanding what the game design is about, but how uh, to build a technical solution that actually proves the design. Um, so it's working with the designers uh, to iterate on the implementation to see um, does this bring it, it closer to their original vision. A uh, bit of a vague answer because it's more like, yeah, I talk to them whenever possible. Awesome. Any, any more questions? You can also now speak up if you want to. Yeah. Uh, there's something more. Mm. Uh, okay, but I would have another question, Quentin. Like, do you do you prefer or ha have you worked on mobile and on uh, PC titles? And do you prefer any kind of UI work? Mm -hmm. I've not worked on any mobile projects. Um, I've worked on uh, a free-to-play game and versus a AAA game. Um, and I can give a distinction between that. Um, the the free-to-play um, market space is much more focused on the, the data. So uh, figuring out uh, how, um, like being more data-driven um, and figuring out uh, like when we place the button in this way or when we uh, add a pop-up here, does it improve our metrics um, or does it um, like hinder us actually? Um, and on the AAA games that I've worked on, um, it is more often like uh, we know exactly what we want to do. Um, so let's implement this design um, and uh, be done with it. It's not like that either approach is wrong, it's that they are different. Um, so for both mobile and free-to-play in general, um, it is about figuring out what data do you need to understand what the player wants to do versus what we want the player to do. And with AAA, it's more, uh, let's build a screen 
uh, let's put it in front of players. Let's see how they react. And if they don't like it, then let's change it up and see what happens then. Now, there's also a question from Alexander. Um, how many iterations for UI design uh, does it take before I can say that something is good? Um, with art in general, uh, it's never done. It's only abandoned. Um, there, there's no hard limit to how often you can iterate on the screen before it's good. It's more you run out of either time or money, um, and then you say it's good enough. What are the 2D tools you use? Um, so if by 2D tools you mean uh, stuff for drawing or um, like laying things out. Um, yeah, for drawing, okay. Um, I personally use GIMP, but uh, nobody likes GIMP apparently. Um, and everyone prefers uh, using Photoshop instead, which I can understand. Um, but an interesting one for me is uh, I do um, do some layout work every now and then. And I use a program called Figma. Um, and it allows you to place elements on the screen. And when you uh, align them, it actually indicates this is now the same distance from each other. And um, the elements, uh, well, it, it's a tool that helps you figure out how to place elements on the screen. Um, yeah. No, I do agree that GIMP is cool, right? But it's just uh, it's not the preferred tool for artists, apparently. But yeah, um, definitely check out Figma uh, if you're interested in UI design. So yeah, what do I think about paper prototypes? Um, I personally like it, uh, so, so that's what Alexander says, um, drawing a sketch of menu or some scene to give a cool impression. Um, yes, I feel very strongly about paper prototypes. Um, you want to have a sketch of uh, a screen or uh, even uh, something to play in terms of game design um, because it allows you to solve problems very quickly. Um, when you make a screen for something like a chat application and you say, these are the dimensions of my screen, um, this is all the info I need to put on there, let me just put all the elements in there as a sketch and it uh, looks like it doesn't fit on the screen. Then you can go back to your designer straight away and say like, uh, how do we do this layout without it being very cramped? Um, the opposite of that is that you say, well, we need a, a text chat, so let's just put it in the game. You try to implement it and then it doesn't fit. It becomes much more expensive to fix that mistake at that point. Cool. Awesome. Um... Yeah, uh, so Amelia linked the program in the chat. Uh, can you name some pros and cons on implementing the UI elements in the game world or right at the character, like in Dead Space? Um, yeah. So, um, Okay, so the advantage of doing it in the game world, and I think what you mean by that is you have your 2D elements and they are placed in the world so they are scaled and rotated appropriately so that when you move up to them, they become bigger, for example. Um, so that's one approach. Um, and the other is to have it right on the character, like in Dead Space. Um, the big disadvantage of doing it the second way is it looks very cool and it is very nice, but it's very hard to iterate on. Um, if you want to have a health bar on the back of your character, like in Dead Space, and you start implementing that, you have to figure out with the animation rigger, like where does it fit? How do we get it in the screen? How do we make sure it's always visible at the right time? How do we actually communicate that to the player? While also not um, screwing up the character design itself. So you need to solve multiple problems at the same time uh, when you have a health bar inside your character design versus having an element on top of your character or on top of an enemy that is free floating. Um, so that I would say is the biggest disadvantage. Um, it's it's a, a disadvantage with uh, what is called skeuomorphic design in general, trying to reduce the uh, amount of UI in the game. Um, 
it's that it looks very nice and it feels very nice to the player, but it can take a long time to get it right. So it's often uh, a very expensive solution. And uh, no comments on skull and bones. Awesome, looking good. Are there any more questions by anyone? Or anyone, uh, anything you want to share or uh, yeah. just say, feel free to talk. <laughs> yeah, what do I think of Adobe XD compared to Figma? I cannot actually comment on this. Like, uh, Amelia, have you used both? I actually used uh, Adobe XD uh, when we, tr well, uh, from Vivian, who is a UX specialist here in Berlin. Mm -hmm. um, what is really good for video game in Adobe XD is that uh, you actually have a gamepad integration and you are, can easily have like state navigation to your backups. So that it's doing really well. Uh, but the curve to learn Adobe XD is just super steep. There's just so much thing everywhere. And uh, yeah, it costs an arm. So <laughs> if you are just like indie dev, uh, something like Figma will really do the job. Um, but yeah, you can expect uh, Adobe XD to be more and more used in a big video game company because they're also uh, taking our need into account in the new versions. Great, great. Okay, I think uh, question-wise, people are kind of happy already. Yeah. Uh, Quinton or Amelia, do you want to add something or say something to the students? I mean, your last words, Quinton, in your presentation, they were really, really powerful. I really liked them. Thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but is there anything else you want to add? Um, just that I, I just want to acknowledge that uh, you guys are the future of uh, our company and other companies. Um, so what I want you to, what I wanted to give you, right, is uh, don't just look at games like ours, like the ones that we make at Ubisoft. Uh, look at the games that your friends are making. Uh, look at the weirdest things that you can find um, on itch, for example. Um, and try to understand like what is it that you like or dislike about those games um, because as a medium I think we are still very young we are still trying to figure out uh, how we can tell uh, good stories with gameplay versus just showing a movie um, and you guys are going to be a part of that you're going to be the next frontier in figuring out how do we make games even better <laughs>